Live from Washington, D.C., it's The Cube, covering AWS Public Sector Summit 2017. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services and its partner ecosystem. Well, welcome inside the convention center here in Washington, D.C. You're looking at many of the attendees of the AWS Public Sector Summit 2017. We're coming to you live from our nation's capital. Several thousand people on hand here for this two-day event, three-day event. We're here for two days. John Wall's along with John Furrier. John, good to see you again, sir. Hey, thank you. We're joined by Jay Littlepage, who is the VP of Infrastructure and Operations at Digital Globe. And Jay, thank you for being with us My here pleasure. on theCUBE. Good to have you. Um, first off, I mean, your company, high resolution, earth imagery, satellite stuff, out of this world business, yep. right? Um, tell our viewers a little bit just about what you do, and the, I mean, the magnitude of what you, and obviously the environmental implications of that, or the right. uh, defense, safety, security, that all those realms. Okay, well, um, stop me when I've said too much, because okay. I get pretty excited <laughs> about that's, this. That's all right. Uh, we, we work for a very cool company. We've been uh, taking Earth imagery since 1999, when our first satellite went up uh, in the sky. Um, and as we've increased our capabilities with our constellation, our latest satellite went up last November, um, you know, we're, we're flying basically a giant camera um, that we can fly like a drone. So, and when I say giant camera, it's got, it's about the size of a school bus, and the lens is about the size of the front of a school bus, and we can take imagery from 700 miles up in space and resolve a pixel about the size of a laptop. So that gives us an incredible amount of capability and the flying like a drone, um, besides just being really cool and geeky, <laughs> um, we can swing the lens from basically Kansas City to here in Washington in 15 seconds and take a shot. And so when world events happen, when an earthquake happens, you know, they're, they're generally not scheduled events, um, we don't have to have the satellite right above the point where there's um, something going on on the ground, we can take a, a, a shot from you know, an angle of you know, a thousand miles away and with compute power um, and good algorithms, we can basically resolve the curvature of the earth and it looks like we're right overhead and we're getting imagery out immediately to first responders, uh, to governmental agencies, so they can respond very quickly to, uh, to a disaster happening, save so, lives. So obviously the, the, the ramifications are, are endless almost, yes. right? The, the ways that, where you can, all that data, I mean, which you can't <laughs> even imagine. Data. I mean, I mean yeah. talk about storage. Um, so that's, that's certainly a complexity. Uh, and then they're making it useful right. to all these different uh, sectors. I mean, without getting too simple, I mean, how do you, how do you manage that? Well, you know, it, it's a big trade-off because ideally, if storage was free, um, all of our imagery in its uh, highest consumable form um, would be available all the time to everybody. Um, each image, uh, a high resolution image, might be 35 gig by itself. So you think of that long of uh, flying uh, a constellation, we've got 100 petabytes of imagery. Um, that's too much, it's too expensive to have online all of the time. Um, and so we have to balance what's going to be relevant and useful to people um, versus cost. You know, a lot of the imagery kind of goes through a cycle where it's interesting until it's not and it starts to age off. Um, the thing about the planet, though, is we never know what's going to happen and when something that aged off is going to be relevant again. And so the balance for my team is really making sure we're kind of hitting the sweet spot on there. Um, the imagery that is relevant is readily accessible and the imagery that's not is in its cheapest form factor possible, which for us is it's compressed and it's in some sort of um, archival storage, which you know, for us now that we've used the snowmobile is Glacier. Jay, I want to ask you your thoughts. Talk, I want you to talk about Digital Globe, but before that, some context. This weekend I was hanging out with my, my friends in Santa Cruz, the kids were surfing. He's a big drone guy. He used to work for GoPro, mm -hmm. and she used to fly the drones, and I go, hey, how's it going with the drones? He goes, got kind of boring. Here's a great photo I created, but after a while it just became like Google Earth, and it got boring. Kind of pointing out that he wanted more, and we got virtual reality, augmented reality, mm -hmm. experiences coming to users. That puts imagery 
place imagery, the globe, pictures, yeah. places, and things, is what you guys do. So that's not going away anytime soon. Right. So talk about your business. What you guys do, some of the things that you do, your business model, how that's changing, and how Amazon here in the public sector is changing that. Well, that's a fantastic question. And our business um, is changing pretty rapidly. Um, we have all that imagery, and it's beautiful imagery, but increasingly there's so much of it and so many of the use cases aren't about human eyeballs staring at pixels. Um, they're about algorithms extracting information from um, the pixels, and increasingly from either sort of the breadth of pixels, instead of just looking at a small area, you can look around it and see what's happening around it and use that as signaling information. Or you can go deep into an archive and see the same location on the planet over and over, over years, and see the changes that have happened um, in, in terms of time frame. So increasingly, our market is about extracting information, extracting insights from the, the imagery, more so than it is the imagery itself. And so that's driving um, an analytics business for us, and it's also driving a services business for us, yeah. which is particularly important in the public sector to actually use that for different purposes. You can imagine the creativity involved in developers out there watching or even thinking about you know, using satellite imagery in context of other data. Remember during the Web 2.0 craze in the earlier in the last decade, you saw mashups of API with Google Maps. Right. Oh yeah, put a little pin, yeah. you know, and then a mobile came. But now you're seeing mashups go on with other data. Right. And I've heard stats that Uber, for instance, remaps New York City every five days with all that GPS data of the cars, which are basically sensors. Right. <laughs> so you can almost imagine the alchemy, the, the convergence of data. This is yeah. exciting for you, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. Share with us. Anecdotally or statistically, what you're well, seeing, how this is playing out. Well, you know, some of our biggest commercial customers of uh, our products now are uh, location-based services. So Uber's using our imagery because um, you know the size of the aperture of our lens means we have great resolution, and so they've been consuming that and consuming our uh, machine learning algorithms to basically understand where. Um, where traffic is and where people are so that they can uh, refine on an ongoing basis where the best pickup and drop off locations are. That really drives their business. Um, Facebook's using the imagery to um, basically help build out the internet. You know, they want to move into places on the planet where internet doesn't exist. Well, in order to really understand that, they need to understand where to build how to build, how many people are there, and you can actually extract all that from imagery by um, going in in detail and mapping uh, roof shapes and roof, roof sizes, and from there extracting pretty accurate uh, estimates of how many people live in a particular area, and that's driving their project, which is ultimately yeah. going to drive access so for- intelligence and software to, to look at imagery. I mean, we hear Amazon recognitions their big product right. for facial recognition, among other pictures. But that's what they're getting at, this notion of actually extracting that data. Well, you, you think about it, you know, once the data is available, once our imagery is available, then you know, the sky's the limit. You know, we have a certain uh, set of of algorithms that we apply to help different industries, you know, to look at uh, rooftops, to look at you know, water extraction, so after a hurricane we can actually see how, how the coverage has changed. Um, but you look at a Facebook, um, you know, and they're applying their own algorithms. Um, we don't like force our algorithms to be used, we provide the, the information, we provide the data, companies can bring their own algorithms and then it's all about what can you learn, and then what can you do about it, and it's amazing. So here's the question, the whole polygot conversation, multiple languages that people speak has translated to the tech industry, uh, and interdisciplinary forces are in play. Data science, coding, um, cognitive, now machine learning. So the question is for you is that, okay, as this stuff comes together, do you speak DevOps? Is kind of a word we hear people say. Is that, is that like Russian, or is that like English? DevOps is a, is a cloud language mindset. Yeah. And so that brings up the question of, are you guys friendly to developers? And because people want to have microservices. I'm, if I'm a developer, I'm like, hey, I want those maps. How right. do I get them? Can right. I buy them as a service? 
Can I, are they loaded on Amazon? How do I engage with Digital Globe if I'm a developer or a company? Well, you, you, you think about um, what you just said and, what, and the customers I just talked about. They're not uh, geospatial customers. You know, they're, they're not uh, you know, staffed with people that are PhDs in uh, extracting information. They're developers you know, yeah. that are working for high-tech companies that have a problem They're they want to solve. They're mobile apps or doing some cool sure. database work here yeah. and there. So, so we're using, um, providing the, the raw imagery in the algorithms to very tried and true um, systems where people can plug into uh, workbenches and um, build you know, artificial intelligence without necessarily being experts in that. And you know, as a case in point, um, my team is an IT team. You know, I, we've got a part of the organization that is all staffed with PhDs. They're the ones that are driving our PhD global. PhD is a service. Well, kind of. <laughs> I mean, you think about it. They're off. You know, they're they're they're, they're driving the leading edge. You know, for these solutions for our customers. But I've got an IT team, and I've got this problem with all this data that we talked about earlier. Well, how am I actually going to manage that? I'm going to be pulling in all sorts of different sources of data, and I'm going to be applying machine learning using IT guys um, that aren't PhDs to actually do that. And I'm not going to send them to graduate school. Um, yeah. They're going to be using um, standard APIs and they're going to be applying fairly generic algorithms and you know, the, the So is that your model, just API it out? Is there other well, data dumps I, I think the, 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 the real key is, you know, it, the API makes it accessible, um, but a machine learning algorithm is only as good as its training. Yeah. So the more it's used, the more it refines itself, mm -hmm. the better our algorithm gets, and so that is going to be the type of thing that the IT developer, the, IT, the infrastructure engineer of the future becomes. And I've already basically, in the last couple of years as we started this journey to AWS, 28% uh, of my staff now, um, same size staff, but they're software developers now. Oh. So, I mean, we'll take this to the government side. We've talked a lot about commercial use. Uh, but to the government side, so I'm thinking about FEMA, disaster mm -hmm. response, maybe Corps of Engineers. Uh, you know, bridge construction, road construction, coastline management, are all those kind of applications that we see on the, uh, the .gov side? Uh, they're, they're all things that you see that um, can be done on the .gov side, but we're doing them all in the commercial environment, um, the U.S. East region for, um, for AWS, and, and I think that's actually a really important distinction, and it's something that I think more and more of the uh, government agencies are starting to see. Um, we do a lot of work for one particular government agency and have for years, but 99 point something percent of our imagery is commercial unclassified. And it's available for the purposes that our customer use it for, but they're also available for all those other customers I talked about. And more and more of what we do, we are doing on the com completely open but secure a commercial environment because it's ubiquitous um, for our customers. Um, not all of our customers do that type of work. They don't need to um, comply with those rigid standards. Um, it's generally where all AWS pro uh, products that are released are released to um, with the other environments lagging. Um, they probably don't want me saying that on TV, but I just did. Um, <laughs> and, and it's cheaper. You know, we're, we're a commercial com company that does public sector work, um, we have to make a profit. And the best way to do that is to put your environment in a place where if you're going to repeat an operation, like pull an image out of Glacier and build it into something that is um, uh, consumable by either a human or an al algorithm and put it back, if you're going to do something like that a million times, you want to do it really inexpensively, and so that's so, where we're So Amazon's that's we're ethos is lower prices, make things faster, that's Jeff Bezos' ethos, yeah. shipping products and like these books in the old days, now they're shipping code and making lower latency systems. So you guys are a big customer. What are the, what are the big uh, implementation features that you have with AWS? And then the second part of the question is, are you worried about lock-in? At some point, you're so big, the hours are going to be so massive, you're going to be paying so much cash, yeah. should you build your own? That's the big debate. Do you <laughs> go private cloud, do you stay in the public? Thoughts on those two um, questions? Def well, we have both. Right now, um, we're, we, we're running a 15-year-old system, um, which is where we create the imagery that comes off the satellites, and it goes into um, a tape archive. Um, last year at reInvent- Wait, uh, tape's supposed to be dead. 
Tape. Tape, <laughs> Tape will <is> die someday. <laughs> um, it's going to die in Digital Globe really soon, but at the reInvent conference last year, AWS rolled out a semi-truck. Well, the real semi-truck was in our parking lot getting loaded with all those tapes. And it's at... Did you actually use the semi for we, the we service? Used, we were the first customer uh, ever, I believe, of the snowmobile. And so, um, it takes a lot of time and effort to move, uh, to basically ingest 12,000 12, LTO5 tapes, um, load it onto a semi and send it off. You know, that's, that represents every image ever taken by DG in the history of our company. And it's now in AWS. So, to your second part of your question, we're pretty committed now. Um, we feel and good about it. you're okay with that? Well, we're okay with that for a couple of reasons. One is, um, I'm not constraining the business. Um, AWS is cheaper. Um, it will be even cheaper for us as we learn how to pull all the levers and turn all the dials in this environment. Um, but, you know, you think about, uh, we, we ran a particular uh, job last year for a customer that consumed 750,000 compute hours in 22 days. We couldn't have done that in our data center. We would have said no. And so, I would have yeah, been no, constraining do, my we business. We can't do it. We can't do it. Yeah. Or, we could do it, come back, the answer will be here in, oh, six months. Yeah. Um, so, and time is of the essence in situations like that. So, so we're, we're, we're comfortable with it for our business. We're also comfortable with it because increasingly, yeah. that's where our customers already are. We were we are creating something in our current environment and shipping it to Amazon I mean, anyway. I saw a movie about you with Jim Carrey, Yes Man. <laughs> you can say yes to everything now with Amazon. Okay, but this is a good point. I'm just joking aside, this is interesting because we have this debate all the time, when, to, yeah. when, when is the cloud prohibitive? In this case, your business model is based on the fact that the variable spend that you turn up your compute is based upon cadence of the business. That's exactly right. You know, the, the thing that's really changed uh, for the business with this model is, um, historically IT has been a cost center, um, and moving into Amazon, I manage our storage and I pay for our storage because it's a shared asset. It's yeah. something that is for the common good. Um, the business units, the different product uh, managers in uh, our business now, have the dial for what they spend on the compute and, and everything else, and so, if they want to go to market really rapidly, um, they can. If they want to spin it up rapidly, they can. If they want to turn it down, they can. And it's not a fixed investment. So it allows business velocity that we've never had before. Jay, I know we're getting tight on time, but I do want to ask you one question. And I did not know that you were the first snowmobile customer, so that's good trivia to have on theCUBE, and great to have you. So while we got you here, with the snowmobile, being the first customer of AWS Snowmobile, when they rolled out at Amazon reInvent, we covered it on SiliconANGLE. What's been your experience? Why, why did you jump on that? And how has your experience been? Share some color onto that whole process. Okay, um, it, it's been a, an iterative learning process for both us and for Amazon. Um, we were sitting on all this imagery. We knew we wanted to get it to AWS. Um, we started using the snowballs um, uh, you know, almost a year and a half ago, but moving 100 petabytes, 80 terabytes at a time, um, it's like using a spoon to move a haystack. So um, when they, Amazon approached us about knowing the challenge we had about um, moving it all at once, I, I initially thought they were kidding. Um, and then I realized it was Amazon. They don't kid about things like this. And so we jumped on pretty early and um, worked with them on this. So you were kind of blown away, like what? Yes, yeah, like, what's the, what's the catch? Really? Really? <laughs> yeah, you, you, a truck? Really? Yeah, but, but really. Um, so <laughs> they, you know, it, it's, it's as secure as it could possibly be. We're taking out the internet and all the, you know, the, the different variables in that, including a lot of cost and bandwidth constraints, and basically parking it next to our data. And you know, it's a, basically a big NFS file system, and we loaded data onto it. The constraint for us being uh, you know, basically that tape library with 10,000 miles of uh, movement on the tape heads, we had to balance between loading the snowmobile and basically uh, responding to our regular customers. You know, we, we pull four million images a year off that tape library. And so, loading every single image we've ever um, created onto the snowmobile at the same time was a technical challenge on our side, more so than Amazon's side. Um, so we right. had to find like that, that sweet spot and then just let it run. And now it's operational in uh, the it's cloud? A, the snowmobile is gone. Um, AWS has got it. They're uh, ingesting it right now into the west region. 
um, and uh, we're looking forward to being able to just uh, go wild with that data. All right. Which is we got snowmobiles, we got we got semis, we have satellites, we have it all, right? We Jim? have it all, yeah. Um, it's massive, obviously, but impressive what you're doing with it. So, uh, congratulations on that front, and thank thanks. you again for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks, thanks, thanks for having me. You bet. We continue our coverage here from Washington, D.C., live on the Cube. SiliconANGLE TV continues right after this. <laughs>